As you guys know, this is a talk about Macau's gaming and non-gaming. We're joined by senior gaming analyst Vitaly Umansky, senior, senior gaming executive Andy Choi, and of course, Ali Tash, who everyone has gotten to hear from recently. So, delving straight in, I'm going to ask this to the group, because I know that you all love to debate each other and, <laughs> and interrupt each other, right, Ali Dad? And, and so we want to look at what the expectations are for 2023. So what can we expect for the two different sides, GGR and EBITDA, in regards to percentages of 2019? So you're saying if 2019 is 100%, how much is that? That was when we had nearly 40 million visitors in Macau. That's kind of the, the visitation that they're expecting. That was what the Macau government is trying to compare everything to. What, when do you think we can get back to similar levels of GGR and EBITDA, and why are those so different? Okay, let me, let me take my first crack just to bring everybody up to how bad 2022 was. Most places in the world, they had a bad 2020, they had a better 2021, and they had even a better 2022. Macau, we went from 100% 2019, 21% in 2020, up to 30% in 2021, down to 14%, less than half of the previous year. So we're looking at a terrible year last yeah. year. It was the worst year on record. It was the worst year since, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. in terms of year on year, of, ever, I can't imagine. Um, I think this year, um, based on, despite all the hype, I think we're gonna be doing something around 50%, maybe 55%, um, which is- Of GGR. Of, of gross gaming revenue, yeah. correct, GGR, relative to 2019. So we're gonna basically go from 14%, jumping up almost four times larger yeah. in terms of GGR. But in terms of um, EBITDA, um, I think given the healthier mix, given the more emphasis on non-gaming, um, I would think um, something in the order of 60, 65% of okay. four years ago, 2019, is reasonable. But mm -hmm. I, I'm curious to hear what the other guys. Yeah, look, there's a lot, of, a lot of variables, I think. I think it largely depends on the visa policies coming out of China and if those change. Those numbers could be a little bit better than maybe what, what Ali Dada is saying. Um, how, how much better, just to put you on the spot? You know, maybe it's ten percent better. You know, on 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 GGR and five to ten percent better on EBITDA. I think I think the issue is, you know, we can always forecast. The problem is, we don't know exactly what things like visa policy are going to be. Yep. We don't know Correct. when all the hotel rooms in Macau will reopen due to labor shortages. Um, assuming all of those things kick in in the next, call it month or two, mm -hmm. those numbers could be a little bit better. Um, but I think. I think the trajectory is what's important, right? 2023 is an artificial construct, right? It's what does the next 12 months look like? What does the next 24 months look like? We had like? to have something to look forward to, right? Yeah, and, but I think it's important to understand that the ramp up will take some time. Um, and then, I mean, we'll get into this, but there's also a whole component of the operators um, looking to do more foreign play, right? Foreign visitation. A lot of that depends on transport capability, infrastructure development, et cetera, that's gonna take a little bit of time. So yeah, things are gonna look a lot better in 2023, they'll look a lot better in 2024, they'll look a lot better in 2025, um, but a lot really depends on kind of these external policies that may or may not impact what the revenue and EBITDA potential could be. But the key to remember is revenue is not gonna get back to previous levels anytime in the foreseeable future because the junket business is gone. Yeah. But EBITDA will get there much faster. That, that is a major thing. I mean, we saw pretty much the evisceration of junkets. We saw um, Sun City's Alvin Chow get jailed as well. Li Vo Chen from Tak Chun, the second largest junket in Macau, also in the court cases. What does that mean? Can Macau ever return to the levels that it saw when junkets were thriving? Absolutely. It, it will, but it will take some time. I'm, I'm in the same opinion with Vitali in that I think within two or three years, in terms of EBITDA, net profit, we're going to go back to the good old days. GGR is a much bigger hole to fill, but it will be filled eventually with additional capacity, additional hotel rooms, uh, more and more mass and more infrastructure. What really differentiates Macau's recovery from Vegas, for example, is that you just turn on 
and more flights come in. There's no additional crew, whereas we're so reliant in Macau and Cathay Pacific for any long-haul flights and the fact that they're you know, airplanes are parked somewhere, you guys were saying, in a, in a desert in Australia. It just, we just can't press the button and bring everybody back to where it was, even for domestic, even for Chinese uh, coming in. There's just not as many flights and captains and crew and everybody else is available to kind of get, go up to speed. Yeah, the, the good news is on a longer term basis, or even towards the medium term, um, there is more capacity in the market, right? So with Grand Lisboa Palace, uh, with the Parisian rebranding. Which is doing excellently. <laughs> well, at, at least there's a room to count, right? I'm just I'm looking at the pure room count, right? Um, and uh, with Galaxy Phase 3 and 4, uh, Studio City Phase 2. Um, so there's a lot more inventory coming onto the market in 2023, 2024 versus 2019. Right? So these are all positive things um, to look forward to um, in, in, within Macau. Yeah, but the challenge is despite, uh, I agree with you, there's going to be lots of additional hotel rooms, but let's do the math. Four-star, five-star hotel rooms in Macau. We're looking at mid-20s, 20,000 hotel rooms relative to Vegas, 150,000. Let's say Galaxy builds 4,000, and we're going to have Studio City later on this year is going to open up another 1,000, 900. And then you got another 1,000, maybe wind goes and spends another, adds another 800 rooms, maybe MGM if they're very generous and the 10-year license is enough. How many rooms is that? That's still going to be in the mid-30s. Is that enough to drive all the additional little fish that are going to replace these whales that we lost? I'm, I'm not sure. Well, it's a 25% increase in rooms, so that's a big number, right? Yes. Um, look, I think, and I've said this for a long time, the, the number of rooms in Macau for Macau to be a truly mass market business is way too low. Macau needs 50, 60,000 rooms minimum in order to really drive a business that is not just gaming oriented, but also non-gaming oriented. Um, and if we start talking about large scale convention capability in Macau, where some of the infrastructure on the MICE side already exists, you're talking 80,000 rooms, right? So when does that happen? Does it ever happen? That That's also, the unknown. That also brings in a major question to the forefront, which is Macau's capacity itself. Because, I mean, if we're having to drive in, they were hoping to have 40 million some tourists within the near future, right? We already saw what happened in 2019 when we had that many tourists, especially during the peak times, the golden weeks, when Macau would effectively shut down because of tourists. So even if it can supply that many hotel rooms, what are some of the issues that it's facing in terms of infrastructure, be it transportation, be it other facilities? Labor. Labor is another one of the things, at least in the short term. It's affecting us right now, you know? We've Correct. only got 70% of capacity of the hotel rooms. So short to medium term, there is definitely a labor issue. The same immigration department that processed five, five applications last year is now being asked to process 10, 20, 30,000 this year because all the people we forcibly kicked out, all the, the, the visa, temporary visa, because the, the integrated resorts could not fire locals, those people all have to be processed back in to be able to service those current existing rooms that desperately need room attendance. And on top of it, construction workers has always been one of the challenges. So we're looking at some serious infrastructure issues and labor issues to even get back to 100% of where we are, let alone the additional 5, 10, or even 25,000 hotel rooms that Vitaly is asking for. We're all asking for. Yeah, and then you have other, other transport connectivity issues as well that need to get resolved if you start talking about bringing in the number of people that we're talking about mm -hmm. to really fulfill what the government hopes to achieve with respect to a tourist destination, right? People need to be able to get around. I mean, you can confine a large number of people to a well-connected kotai, which right now it's not well-connected. Mm -hmm. You can have customers spend all or a bulk of their time down on Kotai. And there's plenty of room in Kotai. There's plenty of room in Kotai to handle numbers. Um, and there's plenty of land in Kotai for future development of non-gaming hotel product. Um, it's just a matter of how does that all get phased in, labor's a big issue, and also just the will to actually do this. Because the government needs to be supportive of these endeavors. Yeah, I, I keep looking at the near term versus the medium to longer term. Um, and I think that all of us would agree that within Macau, um, the short term, uh, you know, the government doesn't always do things the way we would do it or you know, the most efficient way. Say that again. Um, 
But you don't say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I think over the medium term, you know, they, it gets there, right? I mean, if you look at, you know, we're talking about these transportation issues. Um, if you look at the ferry terminals that they've built, um, it, it, it took a little bit longer than one would hope, but the new ferry terminals are massive. Right. Um, the bridge that got built, right, the uh, capacity um, to process people through these things are, is absolutely enormous. Right. Um, and so on certain things, they are laying the groundwork there. Right. Um, the connectivity on Kotai isn't great, uh, but there is a light rail system now um, that does work. Right. And if you're going from, say, you know, Galaxy to a Wind Palace, right, I mean, it, it's, it's not bad. It's not, it's not perfect, um, but you know, it, it's not terrible either. It, it's much better than the busing system that was in place um, previously. Right? Um, eventually, it'll get there. You're an optimist, Andy, and I agree with you. Eventually, they will stumble and do every single thing. But just let me tell you, give you a typical example. For me to come to, to I live in Macau. I wanted to come to Manila, and there's very few flights from Macau to Manila, so I had to go through Hong Kong. I had to take a taxi to go from my home, or a bus, to go from my home to Macau Immigration. Then I hopped on, went through a large, large building, built for th serving millions and millions of people. Then I had to take a golden bus. Again, great, 40 minutes. Once I landed in the golden bus, which is supposed to take you from Macau to Hong Kong Airport, I had to get off, enter Hong Kong, walk out, take a taxi, if, three-minute taxi, go to Hong Kong airport, check in, exit Hong Kong. That's two passports. And without me even having an intention of ever entering Hong Kong, I just wanted to take the airport. Then get on an air Hong Kong airport, come back. That, of course, one day they'll figure out if you want to go and eat this way, one day you're going to figure out this is more efficient. But it just it's the, the frustration is, couldn't they have thought this through a little bit quicker, given the challenges that would be at? Given the fact that we had three years of shutdown in yeah, Hong Kong and Macau, it's going to be easily done. <laughs> so, the, the, I think I think one of the issues is while the Macau government um, is helpful in certain things, there are prime examples of other jurisdictions that are really driven by tourism, where the government acts as a better partner with industry. Um, you know, Las Vegas is a prime example of this, right? If you look at what the Las Vegas Convention Authority does with respect to marketing the city as a whole and how they work in conjunction with um, gaming and hospitality operators in Las Vegas, that is a very good example of a model that works really well. If you think about transport, you get out of Harry Reid Airport, within eight minutes you could be at Mandalay Bay and within 12 minutes you could be at Wynn versus the hour and a half from Hong Kong Airport going right. through two immigration posts. All of these things are solvable, yes. yes. The question is, when do they get solved? How long does it take? And does the government really start acting as a partner in certain parts of this aspect? Yeah. Um, I think they'll get there. It's just a matter of how long it takes. But Tali, it's, you know, the irony of all irony, the irony of all irony is in Las Vegas, the government is only seven, seven and a half percent partner with the casinos. In Macau, there are 40 percent partners, and yet they're doing the least amount relative to, eventually it will happen, but What's, they need to help out. That partnership aspect is very, very interesting because Macau has constantly talked about rebranding itself as a non-gaming destination, but then within the whole lead up to and the signing of these contracts with the, the operators for new 10-year licenses, they basically put the onus of Macau's non-gaming development entirely on the operators. So while they're saying that, that Macau needs to become this new destination, they're not necessarily partnering up. They're saying, okay, we'll give you these new licenses. You can keep the six concessions, but now, guess what? You have to do all the diversification of the economy. Well, look, it's, I think it's less about diversification. I think diversification is a big buzzword. I think it's about creating a broader tourism experience, and companies that are best suited to do that are ones that actually significantly profit off of the gaming industry. The reason why Las Vegas is what it is, in terms of its non-gaming breadth and depth, is because of the casinos. The casinos allow you to build properties that otherwise would never have gotten built with amenities and attractions and features that wouldn't exist in a non-casino integrated resort. So yes, the onus has been put on, on the gaming operators. That's 
the only real way to do it because you're not going to get third-party non-gaming operators coming in and building theme parks that may not be standalone economically viable, whereas coupled with a casino operation, it's a very different economic model. So that's actually important to remember. Um, so I don't think that's actually necessarily kind of a bad thing that the government has done if the objective is to broaden out the tourism. But you can broaden out the tourism without everything we just talked about. Hotel rooms, transport, infrastructure, getting around, you know, waiting 40 minutes for a taxi and then getting into a dilapidated taxi where they pay, you know, you pay cash and if you're a foreigner, you can't use electronic payment because you don't have Alipay. That's not a good way of getting foreigners to come to Macau. See, that's another problem, having lived in Macau, taking taxis all these years. Either allow an Uber to come in, it did come in and it was kicked out. Either bring in an Uber or add more licenses, taxi licenses. For, for whatever reason, but it's a monopoly, the other guys don't get it. The, the, the people who are going to suffer are these foreigners who are not fluent in, in uh, Cantonese or Mandarin that do need a taxi to get around, and they have to wait sometimes 45 minutes for a taxi. Well, speaking of foreigners, Macau has said that, well, they've, they've mandated that the gaming operators have to bring in more foreigners. The, many of the operators have already set up these foreigner-only gaming areas, which the Secretary for Economy and Finance likened to junket rooms, uh, where only foreigners can come in and play. Um, Chinese nationals cannot come in and play. But what is the likelihood that Macau is actually going to be able to do that? We see these problems for non-Chinese speaking people who are coming to Macau. What, what are some of the other issues which are facing the operators in trying to get those foreigners? I think one of the biggest issues is that the business is too good coming out of China. Yeah. I mean, like, why go struggle to go bring in people from another jurisdiction um, and you got to program the food offering for them. You need uh, foreign-speaking staff. Um, when you got willing uh, people coming in from China, right, to take up the rooms and stuff. And um, at the end of the day, right, I think that the uh, you know the government policies. Um, quite frankly, look, if you asked me what, with the license renewals, I would have just said, okay, guys, you want a new license? Tell me how many hotel rooms you're going to build. Right, make Make my problem your problem, right? My problem is I want out-of-market visitors. I want to diversify against it. Um, each of you build 20,000, 30,000 hotel rooms, and then you figure out how to fill them, right? Um, I think something like that um, would have been a, um, a good solution, right? Um, however, that's not the direction they went in, um, and they chose um, to go into the, a much more granular um, level um, and with a lot more accounting um, and accountability for it and hopefully um, with w when the results start coming in uh, I, I think the hope would be that the government sees more right, that the industry responds um, and we do get more um, diversified um, offerings and we do get more people from the other regions, and then the government says, okay, things are moving in the right direction. Um, maybe we can back off some of the uh, paperwork and accounting. I, th I think the issue, I think the issue again, it's some of the operators have set up these foreign gaming rooms. They're very nice. They're built for premium customers. Some of those premium overseas customers will get flown in um, by some of the operators. I think certain operators will do a much better job bringing in foreign customers than others. Um, Such as? Well, an operator like Sands, for example, which has a much larger footprint, has a much larger customer base of customers all around Asia, could create incentive programs to bring people not just to Marina Bay Sands, for example, but also to Macau. Um, operators that have been historically very, very localized, SJM, for example, I think are going to have a much harder time. The incentive the government has provided to bring in foreign, foreign players on the GGR tax is not that material. Right, it's really it's 500 basis points. It's not that material, um, so the operators are going to do it effectively to check a box. Right, the problem you get into when you start talking about really improving foreign visitation is the transport issue. Right, Macau Airport, which would be ideal for somebody flying in, two three hour flight, they land in 10 minutes, they're at the casino. This is Las Vegas, right? Um, look who flies into Macau Airport. Right, they're budget airlines. Um, you're not going to get high quality customers. 
right? So that transport connectivity becomes a big issue. Again, the taxis, the getting around, the lack of language, right? Every dealer has to be local, so they're speaking Cantonese, maybe Mandarin. Um, you have Thai players coming in, you have Malaysian players coming in who are not Chinese, but you want to get some of those customers in. That becomes a bigger problem, it becomes a stumbling block because they can go to Singapore, they can go to the Philippines, they can go to Malaysia, they can go to anywhere else, pick a, pick a country now in Asia. So the level of competition for that foreign player is extremely high. Macau has a Correct. great offering and scale, but all of these other kind of roadblocks need to get resolved. Some of these solutions we're thinking about are not brilliant solutions, which are, these are basic common sense. Open more taxi licenses. You're asking for non-gaming, $13.5 billion you have to commit over the next 10 years. Why don't you go and say, you know, parcel seven and eight, this area sitting right next to Londoner that was taken away from Sands 10, 15 years ago, we're gonna go ahead and have, uh, we'll count that towards you, or we'll give you extra brownie points, we'll give you 100 extra gaming table for every 2,000 hotel rooms you built. Could you guys all come in here, do an auction? Who wants to build me 10,000 more hotel rooms? It's not that difficult. Right? The other one, the no, the no brainer. Why not have a shuttle that takes you directly from Macau Airport all the way through the, the bridge, all the way to Hong Kong Airport? And it, you don't have to check in. You literally are still in the airport. You're, there, there are designated zones. That, that was a missed opportunity both. You don't with have the, to go through double immigration. And the ferries as well. Exactly. So I'm, these are not difficult solutions, and again, maybe the reason is because at one point the government said no more gaming, and now they're kind of stuck, and they don't want to go and say the world has changed, competition has changed, Thailand, Japan, Vietnam, Korea are coming after our people. For us to attract it, I'm sorry, we're going to have to go back and allow a casino to have a casino or hotel next to it. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that 13.5 billion. Just to clarify, within <clears throat> within the new 10-year gaming licenses. Altogether, the six operators pledged some 14.8 billion in investment, over 91% of which was US dollars. 14.8 US dollars, yeah. 14 billion US dollars in investment, over 91% of which had to be dedicated to non gaming. Uh, I just wanted to quickly go into that um, because. For example, looking at Galaxy, it's got its new, the new phase coming online. H how much of that non-gaming spend has already been pretty much put into play? You know, because they, they signed the contracts, they said, okay, and Galaxy not was a, one In of the case amazing. of Galaxy, none of it. Yeah, but, yeah phase it was four. All, new, all new investment. It's going to be all new. Phase four, is, Galaxy phase four, for clear, is not part of the new investment uh, requirement. And it's some strange accounting, right? Well, sometimes CapEx counts, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes expenses count, sometimes they don't, right? So um, it is, um, it, it's a little bit unusual. Right? Um, hopefully, as I keep saying, that it will spur um, innovation. Right? The, the thing that I'm most excited about is the fact that the, the, the operators uh, need to go out and grow the market. Um, they need to go out I mean, and find new players and new customers and hopefully um, micro-target uh, various segments and, and use this opportunity to go out and um, build new distribution channels to bring in new customers. But as we just saw, I mean, some of Macau's uh, decline is actually serving as an advantage to some of the other regions. We were just talking about Hoiana and also. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, so isn't that another major roadblock that it's facing? Where Macau is now competing as well with the other regional properties which already have their own drivers of, of, of customers? I, I just don't understand. I get the 13 and a half billion, whether or not how much of it is incremental, how much of it is not. You're right, there's some unusual accounting that I don't understand. It may, not, it may be perfectly usual, I don't get it. However, which, is more, which brings more guests? A museum or hotel rooms? Um, more infrastructure, more arenas, more venues. These are far more likely, maybe put conditions that every dollar spent in a convention or a hotel counts twice as much as some little one and done, little mini event. I think there are some possibilities, perhaps a collective conversation instead of this current one way, just spend the money, it doesn't matter where. If that money is not being guided towards a larger overarching goal, 
for the next five or 10 years. And I think that's what's actually missing. And again, the, the, the other problem these, these operators face is every single one of these things requires workers, construction workers, and processing of construction workers. That's going to take a long time. Is the government going to speed up its immigration? from a snail pace to something more similar to every other jurisdiction in the world. Hopefully, it's going to be sooner than later. Uh, it, it's interesting that you mention construction workers because we, we were talking a little bit about labor problems, and that's historically been a major problem for Macau on every aspect. So the construction workers, the majority of which are from the mainland, are the largest group of Macau's non-resident worker population. But we've had huge problems with getting labor into the Correct. higher positions as well. Uh, you've all seen that firsthand. You've seen the mass exodus of what has happened to a lot of these higher executives within Macau over the course of the pandemic, sometimes even before, to then be replaced with supposedly local labor. What do you think is going to be happening now over the course of these 10-year licenses? And are they going to be able to run their businesses like they think they should while only relying on local, local labor? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be impossible to do what the government wants them to do if they don't improve labor. Yeah. There's not enough local workers in Macau, right? Population's getting older and it's going to be shrinking at some point. So they're going to have to rejigger. I mean, one of the problems they have is, is mandating that all dealers be locals actually reduces promotion opportunities for people in dealer exactly. positions. I'm an operator, things are busy, I can't afford to lose a dealer to make him a pit boss, you know, keep going up the chain, because I may not be able to find another dealer and I need that dealer working, right? So these types of kind of mandates, you know, initially they sound good, but once you become a full-fledged industry, you actually limit opportunities for individuals. And I think there is a limitation on opportunities for individuals in Macau because of things like who the security has to be, who the dealer has to be, who the driver has to be. Um, and I'm hoping the government will eventually kind of reevaluate all of that. I think it's going to have to. Um, and if you are going to be building all of these non-gaming components, which there's going to be $13 billion worth of things built, um, because I think over the next 10 years, it'll probably be a bigger number. Um, who's going to work all of these sites? It's not locals. There aren't enough people. Yeah, I think, I think this is very similar to taxis. By how could you possibly go and say, I want more foreigners to come visit and gamble, and yet they're faced by law to deal with somebody who only speaks Cantonese and, or, and at times Mandarin. If you allow foreign dealers to come in, not only you export language, English, you also export smiles because Macau dealers don't smile. Right? This is their strength. In many ways, Gambling VIP is serious. dealers, that's that serious. I had 5,000 dealers working for me. They do not smile. And in fact, high rollers love it. They do not want someone to say, where are you from, when the guy has just lost $3 million. He just wants someone who's efficient and knows how to deal and has got ice running in his vein. And that is why we have the world's greatest dealers in the world. In terms of efficiency, in terms of not making errors, and yet we do not have the friendliest ones. Why? Because there's no competition. The guy is guaranteed a job for life, will never be promoted because it works like a pyramid, and there's no way for them to move up. Whereas if they allow us to have foreign labor coming in at lower rates, they'll get the preferential deals, night shift only for the foreigners, you know, things to lure them, that would be good. Same thing with taxis. There's a couple thousand taxi, it's a couple thousand taxi drivers. Every time the government wants to open up another thousand, oh no, you're taking jobs away. No, in, in the long run, it's good for Macau. I want to just bring it back to labor though for a second. So, because you're, you're pointing out the, the locals only for croupiers. <clears throat> but what about what's happening with overall within middle management and with upper management? Because so many of these people left, now Macau is trying to retool itself to be able to handle the influx that it wants to have. These expats have gone to other properties. They've taken off within Southeast Asia, they've gone back to Australia, they've gone to wherever they've gone to. Are they gonna come back? Is there any, given how they've been treated when they were effectively pushed out in many of the cases, 
are they going to want to come back, even if the opportunity presents itself? Look, you pay people enough money that people will come back. Like it's, you know, I, I think it depends on it depends on the environment. If if the government is very bureaucratic and they're putting you through the ringer, and that's the word on the street, people aren't going to bother with it. If they make things more efficient, look, Macau is still a very unique gaming and hospitality environment. Nothing else comes close to it, right? In terms of scale and vibrancy, so there are one-off properties elsewhere, but you don't have the scale of Macau anywhere else not even close, in Asia. So the opportunities are there. The other thing to remember on locals, and you know, Ali Dodd and, and Andy ran Melco properties in Macau, there's a lot of well-qualified locals, right, that have been yes. working in the industry for 20 years who have now been also given the opportunity to step up into more management roles, and that'll continue. That's actually a good thing that should be happening in every industry, right? So it's not necessarily suddenly everyone has to go back and look and say, we've lost all the Australians, let's run back to Australia and find Australian casino table game managers. Like, you don't, you don't need to necessarily do that anymore. Um, but I do think you will have to bring in foreign labor, whether it's on the lower end in terms of, you know, room service, in terms of kind of non-gaming, and you're also gonna have to bring back some management, especially as you start expanding into non-gaming that's gonna be more geared towards certain foreign customers, you're gonna to have to have that expertise, whether it's language skills, yep. whether it's industry skills, and it locally doesn't exist. I'll give you an example, an unusual one. 2015, at Melco, there were 5,000 people in the table gaming department, and 10 blue cards, 10 visas. Out of 5,000, the government said, that is unacceptable. We need you to reduce it. We said, by how much? By two. I said, okay, so you want eight? No, we want two. Only two out of 5,000 5, people in the largest department in one of the largest gaming companies were allowed to be local. And that two is now zero. You cannot be local. You cannot be a foreigner working in table games. I agree these people are allowed, but there is extremism. Right? There is this... And again, how favorable is it going to look to the government when they kind of look at you and say, why can't a local do it? And sometimes there's only 700,000 people in Macau, 680,000. There they used can't. to be 700,000 before the pandemic. Yeah, now there's 680,000, 670,000, 680,000. There's just not enough of these people. And the only way you're able to retain local talent at the banks, at dealers, at... Uh, various locations of management, there's just not, unless you have more babies, you're not going to be able to have this. So you need sometimes labor to come in, not because you're not capable, but simply because there's not enough of that going around. Well, we lost something like 10,000 non-resident workers from the hospitality sector alone over the course of COVID. I think so. And again, on the, a lot of them were on the lower end, but I'm saying yeah. of the three or 400 senior staff, to answer your earlier question, senior management staff that were, let, were the only people that the casinos could lay off, right, during the pandemic was either the low-end people that did the job nobody wanted or the high-end people who didn't have the privilege of being born, being Macau. Those people, there's going to be half as much demand and there's going to be, um, they're once bitten, twice shy. They're afraid of being locked up and 21-day quarantines and more markets coming in. So I think maybe a third perhaps a half of them will come back with the right amount of money, but the de demand isn't there for them simply because the replacement have gained some experience and the casinos are just not as willing to go ahead. They need more Chinese people working in. in uh, this may be a bit of a, a different tact in terms of that, but it's interesting that you mentioned the, the quarantines because that was actually one of the major problems that Macau had in luring the Chinese consumer back during the pandemic. That's why also the fourth quarter of last year was so bad because people were worried they wouldn't be able to get back into China. Yes. <laughs> if there was an outbreak, we saw MGM Kotai get shut down and everybody who was inside it at the time got locked up in their hotel room for three days. Yes. That is something that the government has also publicly stated could happen again. They've mentioned that if, you know, if there is the need for Macau to undergo pandemic prevention measures again, that we could reach those types of, of levels and extreme measures. Yeah, I, I go with the under on that one, right? I mean, I think uh, China's come out and said that, you know, they now need 5% growth on the year. You know, they had 3% the first quarter, which means they have some catching up to do to get to five by the end of the year. 
Um, they've had this um, basically moved away from the zero COVID policy for, what is it, three months now, um, and no reported mass deaths in China. Um, and so I think, you know, the um, horse is out of the barn on that one, right? And I, I, I would think that on a go forward basis, um, we're looking at recovery in China as opposed to sliding backward towards uh, quarantine and health restrictions. Well, let's take a bit more of an optimistic tone. I didn't mean to make this too much of a downer. <laughs> um, let's, looking, let's look at what the best case scenarios are for Macau. You know, going forward, we, we are hoping that 2023 is going to be that transition period. But what is the best case scenario? Is it more hotel rooms, increased connectivity? What else can make it into what the government and the operators are hoping? It's, 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 business, and, uh, it's business and the government working together like a Vegas, like a Singapore. And working out solutions instead of an edict, you know, coming down or instead of one way trying to please. I think, I think Macau has the capability. I think the government is intelligent enough. It just needs to allocate the resources and look at the big picture and not be so worried about what is it going to look. I think it needs to manage itself instead of saying, what is Beijing going to say? I think it's better for Macau to say, we've solved the problem instead of having to say, look, we're sticking to the nationalism, we're sticking to no more foreigners in management position. No, sometimes it's very reasonable to do that. So I think on the positive end, there, whether Andy says it's in the long term, I hope it happens in the medium term, because it's definitely not going to happen in the short term. Are there any other silver linings that we can look for? No, I mean, that's, it's, look, Macau, Macau has always had tremendous opportunities, right? And um, inefficiencies and roadblocks are what has created either hiccups or extreme volatility that we've seen in Macau over the past 20 years. Um, I think with the direction that the industry is going in with, for example, elimination largely of the junket system, it creates a less volatile environment with the bringing in of more non-gaming opportunities, which you talk to a lot of people, you can't make money in non-gaming, okay? That's just utterly not true. You can make money in non-gaming. Correct. Right? Las Vegas, Vegas yeah. two-thirds of the revenue pool is non-gaming. You can do it if it's done correctly, right? And it takes time to get there. It's not gonna happen overnight. Um, so I think this notion that somehow the 13, 14 billion dollars that has to get spent is just a waste of money, that Macau is never going to be anything outside of 90% uh, of the revenues are going to come from gaming. I don't, I don't think any of that is true. Um, but I think in order for it to be really successful, there has to be a broader thinking with both industry and with government about how to make it a destination that it's actually appealing to a broader, a broader universe of customers. Yeah, I think with the right strategy, the $13 billion is more than enough to solve many of the infrastructure. But the, the concept of everybody go, it's like being in a war. You want to go and defeat your enemy, make sure the Navy goes this way, the Marines go this way, the Army, the Air Force, coordinated, you'll be able to win it. But if you just go and say, you go and attack without any game plan. They'll be shooting at each other. They'll be, they'll be wasting so much opportunities. I think with the right coordination, that, that is the positive side. The negative side is whether or not, to answer the second part of your question, is whether or not China will finally go through with its promise of getting rid of junkets and stopping. Yesterday, Vitaly mentioned that even though the junket underground has gone away, there's still two more ways of getting money into, from China into Macau still exist. Jewelry stores and union pay, besides the other business opportunities. Those are difficult. It, the worst case scenario would be for China to want to shut those two out as well. If it sees that there's not as much improvement made in the non-gaming, maybe, maybe it's not achieving its goals as fast as possible. The worst case scenario would be for China to say, starting next month, digital RMB, every single dollar is going to go cashless. We need to track every single person and line up their actual gaming spend against their 
declared income in China. I thought this I was supposed to be the right. optimistic. No, this is the, no, no, no. He said the best and worst case. Your optimism, I'm pessimism here. Uh, I'm, I think that's the worst case scenario. I hope, uh, of all these people, I'm the only one who's a Macau citizen. I have the Macau passport. I want Macau to succeed. I just don't think doing it pre-pandemic methods is going to be the way it works. The world is completely changed and Macau needs to wake up to that fact. As, and as far as like, you know, best case scenario things, um, there hasn't been a lot of talk lately of Henshin Island and Zhuhai. Um, and, you know, if you recall five, six years ago, um, there was a lot of talk about um, the potential there and the developments there. Um, and there's been a lot of infrastructure that's been um, built. It's been up. huge. I mean, the, the skyline is completely transformed. Um, the skyline, yes, but still not a lot of bodies, quite frankly. Um, and, well, but know, also look at what's been built so far in Henshin outside of, of Chimelong, which was built nine years ago. It's mostly residential and commercial buildings that some of them had said half empty. No hotels. Yes. Right, because there hasn't really been a plan of how do you build in Henshin, how do you make Henshin a destination, and then how do you tie Henshin into the rest of Macau? I mean, the easiest way is just to allow free travel between, right? And they have talked about that. And, and you know, we talked about the airport. You know, the Macau airport has limitations. The Hong Kong airport is a little bit far and inconvenient. Um, that airport in Chuhai, um, is a hidden Absolutely. gem there. Right? So, um, so there are reasons for optimism, right? Despite what my uh, pessimistic friend to my left here yes. keeps trying to bring us down. Um, so there, there are areas that if we wanted short term, or if Macau wanted short term growth, um, and given all the constraints that are currently in place, um, there are ways to get that growth. Um, I know we've taken people down and up and down again, kind of it's like Macau's dive. economy. Dives go down, and when you go down, there's some stuff you don't want to see there. Uh, yeah, we're not going up. But I wanted to open it up now to the, the audience here. I'm sure that you guys are interested in asking some questions from our panel here. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Besides Mohammed Cohen. No. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Somebody's asking a question before Mohammed Cohen. Yes, please, yes. please. <laughs> Mohammed, you are next. Um, looking at the situation, for example, from a Hong Kong perspective, right? I live in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is very exciting to a lot of foreigners in many ways. I think Hong Kong has the ability to basically drive, let's say, not just the shopping, the restaurants, the drinks, um, the bars, etc., but also, you know, with, you know, a natural flow of, let's say, where you can go as a tourist. So, in other words, you don't feel when you're going to Hong Kong that it's a one-sided story. Obviously, Hong Kong is an older, you know, very intense city. Is that really have, has there really been a master plan from a Macau perspective with regards to the rest of the foreigners, right, to come? Forget about even the Western side, because there aren't enough bars. There aren't enough, you know, let's say areas to just walk, etc., which we as Westerners would expect into a tourist destination like Macau. I always like to think of Macau, if it could have been the Shamal Shack, of let's say the East, because Sham el Sheikh has done a master plan and a fantastic job at trying to link all of the different properties together. Macau, to me, doesn't feel it has a master plan. So I just wondered how many influences there have been, you know, from a Macau perspective in order to think, okay, how do we, what do the Japanese, you know, tourists expect? What do the South Korean tourists expect? What do, you know, the Westerners expect? Australians, et cetera, et cetera. Where is that plan? I just don't see it. Uh, you know, I look with, uh, you're, that's a perfect example. What a great question. My wife is from Hong Kong, and I always was so fascinated when I first met her. We would be stuck in Kowloon, and the way she would say, this time in the afternoon, let's take a minibus. This time, let's go take the MTR. This time, let's go take a taxi. Sometimes it's easier to walk, hop on a ferry. The way the infrastructure in Hong Kong is laid, it is so superior. And so all Macau doesn't have to go to Las Vegas to see how business is done. Just go to Hong Kong and see how smooth it is. Just to get from the airport into Central, you have multiple ways of doing it, a different pricing. But, so. but aside from the infrastructure side, there is a Macau tourism master plan. There is a massive expansion plan. I mean, Macau has is pretty much half of it is reclaimed land, and we're going to almost add another half again within the coming years, that, that entire area out next to the Hong Kong Joy Macau port, uh, bridge port is going to be transformed as well. They also have plans for two or three other large reclaimed land areas which are going to be developed into a combination of, of commercial, residential and let's see. 
that's also meant to include seaside leisure areas and so on and so forth. But we have seen these plans laid before and then not exactly fulfilled as we wanted them to be. The other thing is, I don't think the master plan necessarily is looking towards international, right? I think it's looking more towards Correct. domestic Chinese. Right? You, you look at the type of ferry terminal, as you said earlier, the capacity there is massive. And I don't think those ferries are coming from anywhere other than the Greater Bay Area, right? I think Correct. Um, most of the infrastructure, most of the plans, um, everything that's being put in place is to service to the domestic Chinese market. Um, and Which is why the, one of the largest infrastructures, one of the largest human transactions between, in the world is between mainland China and Macau. Just the fact that that infrastructure is so beautifully laid out. You're right, they're looking at the wrong side. They need to start focusing at the airports and the bridge and utilize it instead of just, it's just been so easy to sit back and have you know, 70, 80% of the people coming in. One more thing just, I wanna just add. The world has changed in the pandemic and even from the Macau mindset. Back before the 2020, we were a bunch of spoiled people in Macau saying, oh, 40 million people, we don't want them. Our streets are so beautiful. You know well, there what? was a study that said we couldn't take more than 20 million. Yeah, but I remember when it was 40 million, people went on the street and said, oh, our streets, our cities are so beautiful, we don't want them. Once we saw for three years when nobody came in, trust me, I do not mind waiting long lines and seeing all these porners because well, that, that means business. <laughs> no, that means business. I have a choice of going to Fernando's, one of our favorite restaurants, and no waiting line. Yeah, because nobody's coming into Macau. But the fact that I go there now and I wait 30 minutes, it's like that's the price I pay for having a thriving business and economy. I, you know, I think back to 2008, right, 15 years ago, um, you know, when Ali Dada and I were both at uh, Las Vegas Sands, um, and we were looking at what was then called Parcel 5 and 6 opening up, which is now the um, Londoner. London. And I remember sitting in meetings going, how the hell are we going to fill those rooms? And I remember working on things like IFA, right, the uh, Indian International Film Awards. Right? And yes. we worked for weeks and months to get that. Right? Um, and you know, a lot of investment from the company and, and you know, pulled off a great event. Um, those international guests were one and done. Right? I don't think they ever came back into the market. Um, and five and six got, when we opened, got filled immediately. Why? Because Beijing turned on the tap. Right? And that tap has largely been on continuously, um, with the exception of COVID. Right? Um, but that tap has been turned on continuously. And I think on a go forward basis, um, there's no looking back. Right? Um, especially we talked a little bit yesterday, I'm a huge believer in the Greater Bay Area Initiative. I think it solves a lot of problems. Right? Hong Kong has a lot of capital, but not a lot of land. Right? Uh, Macau has some infra unique infrastructure to offer. Right? Then you got the areas of Zhuhai and Shenzhen, uh, which could definitely use uh, some of the know-how in Hong Kong. Right? And I think when you mix the three together and you get a metropolitan area of 30 million people, that are all well connected, and there's high-speed trains going from multiple points into and throughout China. That's pretty exciting. That's really exciting. But we still completely are going to be reliant on China within that. I mean, it is interesting that you mentioned the, you know, the Greater Bay Area because it has you know, GDP that's larger than many, many countries, sometimes put together. Um, but and, the, the, yeah. the reality is it's always going to be dependent on China. It's part of China. It's like saying Las Vegas is dependent on the United States. I, yes, it's dependent on the United States. Does it have foreign visitors? Absolutely. But is it dependent on the United States? Yes. Right? The, only, the only city that can make that, that claim is like Singapore, which is very small right? and doesn't have a domestic market. China is the domestic market for Macau, and that's going to be the majority market. But there are ways to improve the ability of, of, of foreign visitors to come. But, I mean, like you mentioned, Andy, um, China turned the tap on. China can always turn the tap off, right? Should we open it up to more questions? Sorry, I keep taking this down again. My apologies, everyone. Can we open it up to more questions, please? Yes, Mohammed. Hi, I'm Mohammed Cohen from iGaming Business. I got my mask on. Oh, I don't have it on. Sorry. Good. Um, I have a lot to say about what you're talking about, but I won't. Um, 
Are the junkets really dead? I've been hearing conflicting things throughout this meeting and, and over the past weeks about, well, Macau junkets can't work in Macau, but they're still here in Manila. We're still doing business with this one and that one. Or are they truly dead? I thought they would have died. But if you told me the last day of 2022, I thought they would be dead. Surprisingly, they're, they're, they're in ICU. Okay, They're not healthy. They will never go back to what they were, but they're not nearly as dead as we thought they would be. I think it's also important that, you know, not to paint a broad brush on all junkets being the same. Um, you know, I think the function of having a middleman that can go out into various places like China or other jurisdictions um, and have those local connections uh, with the players and facilitate their travel needs and requirements and everything else, I think that'll, that's here to stay, right? And that'll be part of it. Uh, but what we saw out of Macau with the likes of the Sun Cities and the Tak Chuns, um, I don't think that's coming back anytime soon. Yeah, I think the, the model of having a multinational junket model that incorporates Macau and a whole host of other jurisdictions with the ability to move money around those jurisdictions in underground ways the ability to do online gaming into jurisdictions that are closed for online gaming. That model is gone. The model in Macau of having closed off junket rooms effectively operated by, by junket operators with limited supervision, that model is gone. But does the junket model of we go out and we find, help you find players and then you pay us a commission and a large portion of that commission goes back to the player. Is that model dead? No, absolutely not. That model exists. That model also exists in Las Vegas, right, to a certain extent. So, uh, you know, you're always gonna have, as, as, as Andy said, kind of this intermediary model because there's just certain groups of customers. It makes more economic sense for you as a casino operator to rely on a third party agent. But in terms of how that third party agent acts, and what capabilities that third party agent has, that's changed dramatically. And some of it may reemerge in, in, in certain casino operations around Asia, but for a Chinese junket who's bringing mainland Chinese players in, or trying to, you're dealing with a whole new regime in China when it comes to this business. That's where it's gonna be, that's where it's gonna be very, very different. I think just to put some numbers in behind it, if, if, China, if the junkets accounted for 33% of revenues four years ago, I think going forward, the peak would be like 10% or single digit at most. They will still be there, but not to the same. And they cannot penetrate China. I mean, part of, one of the biggest functions they did was to go constantly remind the player to bring people. That's forbidden. And the second felony they committed was to bring money over. That's over. But the Korean junket, the Japanese junket, some of the more legitimate ones from China where everything is transparent, that does exist. And it's long, larger than I would have thought but eh, 10%. Look, smaller operators across Asia that don't have the marketing capability to go out and reach a wider band of customers in a variety of jurisdictions are gonna rely more and more on third-party agents and they're gonna pay for that, right? Larger casino operations that think about customer segmentation are able to access markets and locate players and incentivize those players to come. They will rely less on an intermediary. And here's one more. Chen mentioned in the previous panel, uh, you know, when they're offering them 62% commission and Macau is giving you 42% commission and all the scrutiny, you know, obviously they're gonna go elsewhere because it's more money, they just have to convince the player to go elsewhere and every once in a while they are able to do that. So that's definitely a plus for the junkets. Yeah, but that's been the case for the last eight years, nine years, right? The, the, the tax the scrutiny, arbitrage. The scrutiny is far worse now. But the tax arbitrage that has existed for tax differential between jurisdictions Correct. and the ability of an operator, instead of paying 42 or 43 percent, to pay 70 percent or 80 percent because they don't pay tax, that's always been there. Um, okay, but why has the junket operator been able to get all of that surplus? He that's, hasn't. He shares it with the customer. Well, but largely, you know, the, those tax differentials 
are supposed to go back to the operator to have more investment into the property, and so on and so forth. But for the most part, right, they've gone to the junket operator and the player. Well, that, that goes back to public policy within that jurisdiction and what the government is trying to achieve, right? So I think, uh, you know, I think there's also a, often a lot of confusion about what the junket actually makes in terms of the commission. Um, and what the player actually gets. And even in, in these jurisdictions where the commission rate is higher, junkets may be at the same profitability level as they are in Macau, maybe lower. I mean, the junkets made money in a variety of ways that was completely off the table, right? Under the table betting, online betting, a whole host of ways, investing funds, getting people to buy real estate, um, holding on to money for players. There's a whole machine. A lot of that has been dismantled. Um, but you know, I think, again, these operators that exist in one-off locations that are smaller, they're not going to have the marketing capability to reach a wide segment of customers without relying on third parties. And whether you want to call that party, what is it, an IOT? Or whether you want to call it, uh, whether you want to call them a junket agent or a player's rep. ITO, or, International Travel Operator. ITO. Uh, or a player's rep, or whatever you want to call them, there is a place for that business model, but that business model is, is drastically going to be different than it had been in the future. And all these other jurisdictions where there is that regulatory arbitrage, if you will, right now, right, with Macau having more scrutiny. As the world moves forward, there will be more and more scrutiny in these other jurisdictions. As these jurisdictions develop, we'll have more scrutiny, right? Five years ago, Australia had no scrutiny. Now it has more scrutiny than anybody else. Than most of anybody, yeah. So, you know, I think, I think places like, even places like Philippines, Cambodia, Vietnam, the tide will turn eventually. And things will have to become more transparent. So, an optimistic future 30 years from now. There is just one, one more thing that we didn't touch upon um, now that we're talking about junkets. Uh, satellite casinos. Is there a future for satellite casinos within Macau? We did see that you know, some of the, um, the operators were able to continue to operate satellite casinos, such as SJM, which had most of them, but greatly, greatly reduced. Is that going to continue to be significant in terms of contribution to GGR within the 10 years of the, this license? these licenses? No, I mean, contribution in terms of GGR was falling already and it's going to continue to fall. Um, I think less than half of the satellite operators that were operating in 2019 are still operating. A couple of those properties are probably viable properties to some extent. Um, I think many of those properties over some time period, it's impossible to say how long it's going to take, are, are probably going to have to get shut down and, 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 and reutilized in a different way in terms of the property itself, um, which also then frees up tables. Right, so, um, except probably in the wrong operator's hands, All right, because they're mostly SJM. Actually, the satellite ones, there was at one point something like 20 total satellite casinos, and there were all the three Chinese companies. Galaxy had three, Melco had one, and like the rest were all SJM. And I think the government got rid of half of them, and could have gone further, but then it had to stop because they forced the operators to take their, their labor, right? They did not want unemployment. The unemployment is not raised. I think as business starts to revive and things are looking good, knock on wood, I think slowly but surely, through the chief executive's new powers of them setting minimum tables, minimum uh, win per day on slots and tables, and later, later on allocating additional or taking away some tables, I think I wouldn't be surprised if within the next couple of days that 10 goes down to five. And then a few years later, they will kind of stay at three or four and be incorporated, which is a significant improvement because those satellites being in the location and the, the minimum investment they do, they don't necessarily bring up Macau in terms of what a beautiful, gorgeous integrated resort Macau has. Um, I think they'll eventually go away. Well, gentlemen, unfortunately, I think we have to wrap this up. We're coming up on our next talk here. Thank you so much. This was deep. We, we were finally allowed to talk in depth about Macau. And thank you to the audience for your questions as well. Can we get a round of applause for thank the three you. gentlemen here, please? Thank you.